Hello everyone, welcome to Creating Power. I sincerely hope that you can enjoy a pleasant reading time. Today, I'm sharing a book called, Shoe Dog with you all. It is the autobiography written by Nike founder Phil Knight himself. In April 2016, Nike founder Phil Knight published his autobiography in the United States. As soon as this book was published, it immediately topped the New York Times bestseller list. After reading it, Bill Gates gave high praise, saying it was one of his top five favorite books of 2016. Domestically, this book has also been recommended by business tycoons. The book is titled Shoe Dog. What does this mean? Nike says in the book that a shoe dog is someone who loves shoes and treats it as their career. Shoe Dog chronologically tells the 18-year history of Nike, from when Knight first had the idea to start a business in 1962, to when Nike went public in 1980. I will explain this book to you along two main threads, the entrepreneurial journey and entrepreneurial experience. Let's first talk about Nike's entrepreneurial journey. The development history of Nike is the story of struggle of a group of shoe dogs. Nike founder Phil Knight himself is a typical shoe dog. Let's rewind back to America in 1962, it was an era when hippies were prevalent, rebellious young people had long hair, lived idle lives, did drugs, listened to rock music, rebelled against society, and rejected tradition. In Oregon, there was a young man who did not fit in with this culture at all. He was shy about sales, pale, never did drugs or smoked, and didn't even date girls. In the eyes of others, he was a model good student. He graduated from the University of Oregon for his bachelor's, then later got his MBA from Stanford Business School. Perhaps you can guess who this person is, the protagonist of this book, Phil Knight. Although young Knight seemed gentle, his heart was extremely turbulent. Unlike the external excitement of those hippies, he often asked himself late into the night, what is the meaning of life? Money? Houses? No, what he wanted was to be different, to leave a mark of his existence in this world. At that time, Knight's ideas seemed a bit cliché, very much like the passion and arrogance of young people today. But the huge Nike empire of today originated precisely from his arrogance as a young man. Knight's idea for entrepreneurship started during his time studying at Stanford. He took a discussion class on entrepreneurial spirit, and because he liked running, he wrote a research paper on running shoes. Knight discovered that at that time, the leading brand in the camera market was German, but was later overtaken by Japanese products. In the field of running shoes, the market leader at that time was the German brand Adidas. Knight believed this market would also be overtaken by Japanese products in the future. Knight's thesis was well received, for most students, this is where it would end. But for Knight, this was just the crazy beginning. He was not satisfied with the grade, he wanted to fly to Japan to find a shoe manufacturing company to distribute in America. Knight had his eyes on Onitsuka Tiger shoes, he went to Onitsuka's headquarters and said he wanted to distribute their products in America. It just so happened that at that time, Onitsuka also wanted to enter the US market, so it was a perfect match. Knight was overjoyed and immediately notified his father back home to pay Onitsuka $50 as deposit to purchase 12 pairs of Onitsuka shoes. After a long two-year wait, around Christmas 1964, Knight received 12 pairs of creamy white Onitsuka Tiger shoes. And so, Knight started distributing Japanese running shoes, embarking on his long and arduous entrepreneurial journey, one that was typically obsessive. Shoe dogs flocked together, and more shoe dogs gradually gathered around him. Among them, the most noteworthy were legendary coach Bill Bowerman and genius salesman Jeff Johnson. This Bill Bowerman was Knight's track coach during his undergraduate years at the University of Oregon and was a shoe dog that Knight both loved and hated. Bowerman would often sneak into the athlete's locker room and secretly take their shoes. He would then spend days taking the shoes apart to observe the internal structure, then sew them back together and return them to the athletes. These unintentional modifications sometimes made the athletes' feet uncomfortable, even causing them to bleed. But after all, Bowerman was their coach, so they couldn't do much about it. On the school's track team, Bowerman experimented on the 4th of May people, and Knight just happened to be his favorite. Knight couldn't even count how many times he had to wear shoes modified by Bowerman, from freshman to junior year, and lose races because of it. Even during Knight's senior year, Bowerman would still personally make shoes for him. 
Bowerman had an obsessive love for shoes, so Knight immediately thought of him when he got the Onitsuka Tiger shoes. Without a second thought, Knight sent Bowerman two pairs. Bowerman was extremely excited when he saw the shoes, and immediately proposed that he wanted to be a partner in this business and own half the shares. Knight was also very happy and readily agreed. And so Blue Ribbon Sports, Nike's predecessor, was established. Tonight, Bowerman was a genius shoe designer. He could constantly come up with new product ideas, which greatly helped Blue Ribbon's sales in its early stages. Let me give an example. In 1966, he discovered that the outsoles of Onitsuka Tiger shoes at the time would melt like butter while the midsole was quite sturdy. He wrote to suggest Onitsuka improve the outsole material to create shoes suitable for long distance running training. Initially, Onitsuka headquarters had a very cold attitude, but the colder they were, the more persistent Bowerman became. He would write more letters, emphasizing the importance of these opinions in increasingly extreme and obsessive tones. Finally, Onitsuka designed a new athletic shoe model based on his suggestions, called the Cortez. Consumers loved this shoe. In 1966, Blue Ribbon sales were $44,000. After the Cortez was introduced in 1967, sales quickly doubled to $84,000. Bowerman was this kind of general talent. Knight treated him as the company's cornerstone and spiritual pillar, and it was not excessive at all. In addition to products, there was another extremely important part for Blue Ribbon sales. Fortunately, Nike met another shoe dog, Jeff Johnson. Johnson was a friend Knight got to know through running at Stanford. Like Bowerman, he also liked running an Onitsuka Tiger shoes. He felt running was a mystical practice, and he himself had received a call from God to help runners reach heaven. This may sound a bit unfathomable, but the inner heart of crazy characters must be just as crazy. Johnson had a mad passion for sales, an obsession with buying and selling shoes that was almost maniacal. He kept writing letters tonight, almost every day detailing every little thing about the sales process that week how many Onitsuka Tiger shoes he sold, who wore Onitsuka Tiger in competitions and what their final ranking was, and so on. He even thought further than Knight did, contemplating and planning advertisements and retail stores. Johnson kept asking Knight for authorization to open retail stores. For a madman and genius like this, don't restrict or guide him. On the contrary, you should give him more space and challenges. Knight gave Johnson a sales target that was almost impossible to achieve, if Johnson could sell 3,250 shoes in the first half of 1966 he would agree to let him open stores. And Johnson did it. How did he do it? He worked seven days a week, tirelessly selling products. He was skilled in sales techniques. When communicating with customers, he would proactively build his own consumer database. He created an index card for each new consumer that contained information like their shoe size and preferences. By building this database, Johnson kept in close contact with all consumers at all times. He would send greeting cards to customers every Christmas or on their birthdays. He treated these customers like good friends. One customer complained that the flat-bottomed athletic shoes from Onitsuka Tiger did not have good enough cushioning. He was going to run in the Boston Marathon, but felt he couldn't complete the 42 kilometers wearing Onitsukas. So Johnson hired a local shoemaker to transplant the outsole of a different shoe onto the Onitsuka Tiger outsole. This really worked. That customer achieved his personal best time at that Boston Marathon. Tonight, Bowerman and Johnson were like his left and right hand men, these three shoe dogs were either crazy, obsessive, arrogantly confident, or unfathomable. But under the efforts of these shoe dogs, Blue Ribbon maintained rapid growth, with sales doubling every year, going from $44,000 in 1966 to $600,000 in 1970. However, there is unpredictable wind and rain in the sky. In 1971, the seemingly sweet cooperation between Blue Ribbon and Onitsuka showed cracks. Seeing the huge market in America, Onitsuka decided to tear up the agreement and abandon Blue Ribbon's exclusive distribution rights. By then, Knight had also vaguely sensed Onitsuka's ulterior motives. In 1971, Knight invited Onitsuka executives, including Kizo Tokahoshi, to visit America. During a private conversation in Knight's office, Tokahoshi and Knight had an unpleasant exchange. 
Knight felt something was wrong. He secretly looked at Takahashi's documents and found a list of 18 sports shoe distributors in America, as well as scheduled meeting times with half of the distributors. This was simply disastrous. The endless competitors would mire Blue Ribbon, who enjoyed exclusive distribution rights, into a quagmire, facing cold and merciless business betrayal. Nike had no choice but to seek a new way forward again, where was Nike's way forward? As Nietzsche said, what does not kill you makes you stronger. A new brand was about to be born. Knight decided on a two-pronged approach, legally Su Onitsuka on one hand, while establishing an independent brand on the other, looking for other factories to manufacture for them. They designed a dynamic swoosh, which is the Nike logo we see today. It's like the trace an athlete leaves behind in the air. They chose a name for this brand, Nike, meaning the Greek goddess of victory. Nike was established in 1972. Over the next eight years, Nike quickly grew into the market leader in America. There were two milestone events during this time. One was the launch of its first star product, the Waffle Shoe, in 1974, which allowed Nike to challenge Adidas and lay a solid foundation for its IPO in 1980. The other was developing air technology in 1977, providing the killer weapon that would defeat Reebok in the 1990s. The Nike waffle shoe originated from an offhand complaint at a company meeting in 1971. At that time, Nike casually said that athletic shoe outsoles had not changed at all in the past 50 years, the shape had always been wavy or grooved, there was no innovation. At that time, Bowerman nodded silently in agreement. For Bowerman, the 1972 Munich Olympics was the next year, and he would also be the head coach for the US track team. The internal complaints and external pressure from the Olympics forced him to look for new product ideas. He wanted to create a more comfortable athletic shoe. The following weekend, Bowerman was having breakfast with his wife and saw the waffle iron used for making waffles. The waffle grid pattern instantly inspired him, this was the outsole pattern he wanted. So he took the waffle maker from the kitchen to the workshop. He wanted to create an outsole with the same waffle pattern. He first tried pouring polyurethane into the iron and heating it up, but the iron was ruined without producing any outsole. But he did not get discouraged and bought another iron, this time pouring in plaster, but still failing. Later he completely abandoned the waffle iron and found a piece of stainless steel to carve holes in, creating a waffle-like surface. He brought this to a rubber company and finally produced a waffle patterned outsole. In 1972, the waffle shoe started being used by professional athletes in athletic competitions. Athletes really liked the grip from the waffle shoe, and word of mouth about the product spread rapidly. After that, Bowerman made further improvements and finally launched the iconic waffle racer in 1974. With its strong grip, novel design, and extremely low price, this shoe became the best-selling training shoe in America as soon as it came out. By 1976, the waffle shoe was no longer just sports equipment, it had become a cultural fashion item. People wore it for training, school, and work, accompanying them throughout their daily lives. Before the waffle shoe was introduced, Knight had been busy with issues like banking loans and cash flow pressure. After the waffle shoe was introduced, things were completely reversed. Production could not keep up with demand. In Knight's own words, at that time retailers and sales representatives knelt down begging us to buy all the waffle shoes. Knight liked to quote MacArthur saying as his motto, rules are for the obedience of fools and the guidance of wise men. The waffle shoe was the shoe that broke conventions. The success of this shoe laid a solid foundation for Nike's IPO in 1980. Following the launch of the waffle shoe in 1974, the introduction of the air shoe in 1977 was another milestone event in Nike's history. The inventor of the air shoe was an eccentric aerospace expert named Frank Rudy. How eccentric was he? He would strictly record details about his sex life and bowel movements. In others' eyes, he was simply a madman. But he invented a method to inject pressurized air into the shoe sole through airbags, so that the air in the shoe would give people a floating feeling during exercise. Knight immediately decided to collaborate with Rudy and create an era-defining air shoe. After that, Nike successively launched sports shoes with air technology. So here ends part one on Nike's entrepreneurial history and development.